So our next section in this talk is about vaccine care and usage in beef cows. Vaccines, like the drugs we've talked about, have a label. And there's lots of effort that's gone into by vaccine sponsors, the drug companies that create these labels in concurrence with the USDA Center for Veterinary Biologics on what these labels should say, how they should say it, um, uh, slaughter withdrawals, uh, directions on time of year or how often to give, when to give the booster dose. So it's very important and critical to read what the label says on each vaccine that you have in your operation. All vaccines are different. Uh, there are, some of them can be killed virus vaccines. Some of them can be modified live. We can have Bactrins. We can have subunit vaccines. We can have custom-made autogenous vaccines, which I'll talk about. So please read the label and understand what that says, because those are put on the bottle for a reason. When we talk about vaccines, I mentioned killed versus modified live. We have lots of different types of products out there. Uh, they all have varying durabilities and how tough they are, but we want to make sure we take care of our vaccines. Excessive heat and freezing can actually damage the proteins in these vaccines and inactivate them. I don't want to put this bottle on the dashboard of my truck as I'm bringing up cows in the pasture. I don't want to expose it to UV light or excessive heat. If we're vaccinating in January or February and it's sub-zero out, I don't want my vaccines uh, to get too, uh, too cold and freeze up because that will damage the proteins in them as well. So we want to make sure we take care of the temperature requirements for the vaccine and those should be on the label. If we're vaccinating in hot weather, what I like to do is take my uh, vaccine syringes, my vaccine bottles, sometimes automatic dosing guns too if we're using those, uh, and put those in a box. You can also get uh, vaccine coolers where you can actually, with holes and ports where you can slide your vaccine guns inside. Um, we put freezer bricks in our vaccine boxes as we're vaccinating our cows here at the station and at our places at OSU. Great for the summertime. Uh, what people also forget in the wintertime for vaccinating, if it's really cold out, you can actually pop these in the microwave and warm them up to about 100 degrees and put them in your box um, and actually keep the vaccines from freezing up as you're administering to the cow. So it can actually work both ways. These, these freezer bricks are quite handy. When we're giving vaccines, we want to use the entire bottle up when we're working with that particular group of cow or calves and do not reuse. This is very true for vaccines that we call need to be reconstituted or mixed. So this is just a, a 10 dose bottle of Bovashield. So we've got the dry lyophilized powder of the vaccine and a sterile diluent. And sometimes that diluent will have some further vaccine products added to it. This has got the lepto portion of the vaccine. We're gonna take that with a clean needle and syringe every time or a transfer needle and place that sterile diluent or or a wet part of the vaccine into the dry part. Once that's mixed, we need to keep that cool and use it within 24 hours. Ideally, immediately, but if you've got some cows or calves to vaccinate later in the day, great. Keep it cold and use it up before the end of the day. Some uh, producers tend to think that if we have multi-dose vials here that are pre-mixed, if we just take several doses out, we can put it in the fridge and two months later or in the next season, this, this vaccine will still be good and I would not recommend that. Once you break the seal, of the top of this vaccine with a clean needle, please use the entire contents and then discard because we can get bacterial contamination, we can get air um, into the top of those bottles and that will cause issues with the, the viability of the vaccine. So it's critical to follow the directions and then discard what you have not used um, and put it in the trash. Here's another type of vaccine here. This is an intranasal vaccine that can be used in cows. Uh, Enforce, this is an also one that needs to be reconstituted. It's got a powder and a liquid. When I'm giving vaccines here at the stations, and many producers do too, we use these multi-dose guns. One of my pet peeves with multi-dose syringes is clean them aggressively. Uh, when we open up to these vaccine syringes, I can find all kinds of a cornucopia of microbes growing in them. Uh, fungus, bacteria, all kinds of um, residues from the materials that have been in there, and they may be even antibiotics in that particular syringe that's later used for a vaccine, which would counteract everything we want to do with vaccine safety and efficacy. So make sure you tear your guns apart, wash them in warm soap and water. If you disinfect them, great. Make sure you rinse all the disinfectant out of these guns with sterile water, which you can get from your veterinarian or boiled water. Make sure it's clean. You want to make sure we don't have any residual disinfectants or any chemicals that can kill our vaccines or cause damage to them uh, before we give them to their cows. So make sure that these guns are clean. One thing I do when I buy these guns is buy an extra, several extra sets of uh, piston rings. So I'm gonna take this gun apart again. This piston ring that seals against the barrel. 
Uh, oftentimes it will get old and will break down and will get crusty, it needs to be taken out. I would recommend just swapping those out every time you clean that particular guy. The thing I want to talk about also before I talk about vaccine protocols is needle safety. I've been stuck many times with needles both by myself and also other producers that are working around me for vaccinating cattle together. When we use multi-dose guns or even syringes uh, that have lure locks, we need to screw the needle on. It's great. Have a fresh needle. Ideally, we want a needle for a new needle for every animal. Now that's not practical in large situations where we got to vaccinate hundreds of animals in a day. We want to change our needles out frequently. I, I like to do it at least every 10 animals. Um, if you look at close-up images of needles that have been pushed through a cow five times, there's a big burr that develops on the end of that needle. Number one, it's harder for you to push that into the animal. Number two, it's more traumatic to them. You also increase the risk of breaking that needle off in the animal. Also, when these needles get bent to either side, they're at high risk of snapping off in the animal, and that's an animal we cannot market for food. If we know it has a needle stuck into its uh, neck, it cannot be... Uh, market as food that's considered adulterated by the Food and Drug Administration. So we have to dig that needle out. So if you see a needle bent on one of these automatic dosing syringes and on a regular syringe, take it off. Um, be careful recapping. Um, I like to, and we all make mistakes, and we all try to recap by hand, but I poke myself many times doing that, so I try to avoid that. One of the things you can do is the lift and scoop method. So I'm going to take my needle and syringe, and I'm just going to scoop up the cap if I can get it. There, so I didn't touch the end of the needle and I can push it down. You can also use it with a needle and syringe and then pop it on the table uh, to pop that back on there. If I don't want to recap, and sometimes if you've vaccinated many cattle and you may have experienced this, this needle becomes frozen or jammed on this lure on the end of the lock, I use a pair of pliers to twist the needle off and drop it into my sharps container. Don't put needles in the trash. Uh, that is actually against state and federal law. You want to make sure you dispose of your needles and sharps properly. When it comes to designing a vaccine protocol for a particular operation, um, I look at basically what do we consider core vaccines or the essential vaccines that every cow should get, every beef and dairy cow, beef and dairy calf should get. And then we go to the optional vaccines outside of that. So what do I as a bovine veterinarian consider core for beef and dairy cattle? So we're gonna talk about the clostridial vaccines, black leg, uh, the clostridium chovii septicum, Novii Sordelli. These products are standard and should be given, given to cattle at least twice yearly, both beef and dairy cattle, uh, without fail. These are cheap insurance against the opportun opportunistic clostridial pathogens. So these are typically seven to nine way type preparations, depending on the, uh, the type of clostridium that you fight in your operation. But every beef animal should get this vaccine at least twice a year. That's considered core, the, the clostridial vaccines. Another thing that I consider core for beef and dairy cattle are the viral respiratory pathogens. Here I've got a modified live vaccine. This is Bovishield. You may use Kill, uh, something like Virushield or Cattle Master. These are going to be, these are going to include bovine rhinotracheitis or IBR vaccine, uh, BVD, bovine virus diarrhea, and bovine respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. Those are the core respiratory viral vaccines that all cattle should get too, whether ideally once a year with a modified live or twice a year, at least twice a year with the killed vaccine. This product also contains an optional uh, vaccine for leptospirosis. Most of those are in combination. These lepto vaccines are in combination with the viral vaccines and that's just fine. That's how we deliver our combinations here. We actually booster our lepto alone by itself later in the fall. So I consider the clostridial vaccines and the viral respiratory agents to be core for beef and dairy cattle. What do we consider optional types of vaccines. So we also here at our research stations at OSU, we want to prevent our cattle from getting respiratory disease. We also use an intranasal vaccine, very safe, extremely effective, lasts about 90 days. So a little bit shorter duration than our injectable vaccines that we would deliver under the skin. These are placed in the nose and develop mucosal immunity in cattle. I really like this vaccine for newborn calves and calves that are going to undergo challenge. So those are calves that are going to be weaned and placed in the feedlot or weaned and trucked to a distant feedlot or sale barn. Very good protection, um, and I advertise the use of intranasal vaccines. Another type of vaccine that we use here that we consider non-core or optional is we have an autogenous bacterin. An autogenous bacterin is a custom-made vaccine. It's not commercially available. You can't drop into PBS um, or any of the catalogs and buy this. This vaccine was custom-made for Eastern Research Station by Addison Biological Laboratory. 
we have an issue with pink eye, a lot of, like a lot of beef operations do in Ohio. Um, in the traditional vaccines uh, for pink eye, which contain bacterins for Moraxella bovis, the historical uh, pathogen we consider uh, most important for cattle, aren't effective uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, we don't really understand why totally. But one of the things that we figured out here recently in the cattle world is that we have extra bugs that are causing pink eye in cattle year round. One of those is Moraxella bovoculi which used, used to be considered a sheep pathogen, which we found in cattle now too. When we went and had a, a very serious discussion on our operation about why we continue to fight pink eye and use lots of antibiotics, um, lost days of feed and pain and suffering for those cattle, we consider let's go to an autogenous factor. And there's lots of different labs, not just Addison Laboratory that can make these products for you in conjunction with consultation with your, with your, with your veterinarian, which you will need. Uh, what we did is we swabbed the eyes of our calves, sent off for a culture, they found three different variants of Moraxella bovoculi, a Mycoplasma bovoculi, and a Moraxella bovis. And they were able to make a custom vaccine for us, which they can do for two, two years in, in cereal and freeze the samples for us and produce a new run of vaccine every spring for us. In the third year, you can actually renew that vaccine. But after that, according to federal law, you actually have to reculture your cows and submit again. But it's been an effective vaccine for us. Um, there are also uh, solid back or um, pellet type vaccines that producers and veterinarians have used for custom uh, pink eye protection on farms have been very effective too. So that's just another optional type of vaccine you can use out there for pink eye protection.